We all know investments are associated with a level of risk. Are you an investor or are you a speculator? Maybe you don't even know, and I'm going to explain that to you, but I'm going to teach you about the myth of risk that most investors don't understand. We're also going to have a talk about how much the average Australian is losing to scams. You'd be surprised how many people get scammed every month, every week, in fact, every day, how much we lose. I'm going to explain that with a special guest today, and then I'm going to teach you about what successful people don't do in my mindset moment. So at the end of today's show, you're going to be a much more informed investor, hopefully won't get taken in by scams, and you'll understand a lot more about risks than you thought you did. Welcome to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator, who has once again been voted our leading expert in wealth creation. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. Believe it or not, Australians lose more than a million dollars a week to scammers. In fact, it's probably more than that. That's what they report to the ACCC. And today we talk with Bessie Hassan from Finder.com about who gets scammed, what to watch out for, and how to protect yourself. And I'm going to explain to you what successful people don't do in my mindset moment. But the main chat today will revolve around the myth of risk. I'm going to explain a bit about what the difference is between investing and speculating, because when I speak with clients, while most of them think they're investing, what they're really doing is akin to speculating. But the problem is they don't recognize this. You see, all investments come with an element of risk. But in my mind, it's important to minimize your risk as an investor. So what's the difference between investing and speculating? Or am I just using words? Well, an investment is one through which you analyze fundamentals and principles and minimize your return. I guess the underlying assumption is that an investment is more likely to give you consistent returns, while speculation is more likely to be inconsistent. Look, all investments come with risk, as I said a moment ago, and the risk, I guess, can be defined as the probability or the likelihood of the occurrence of losses relative to the expected return on that particular investment. Um, so what is the difference between investment and speculation? Well, to me, investing is purchasing an asset to earn a return. And you make that decision based on evidence, based on fundamentals, based on long-term horizons, so the timing isn't usually an important part of it, and you aim to profit from it. On the other hand, speculation is more risky. It's based on the hope of a profit. It's based on hearsay or the next hotspot or chasing the next big thing or Bitcoin or looking for the next Google. It's usually based on short-term timeframes, so timing the market is important. And you're hoping to make money out of a rising market, and therefore it's more unreliable. So why do some investors think they're investing when they're really speculating. Well, they're looking for, that's going to be the next growth area. That's going to be the next hotspot. That's going to work now. I don't look for investments that work now. I look for investments or locations that have worked in the long term because things will work now for a week or two, for a month or two, for a year or two. But I want things to work in the long term. And so that's a big difference between investing and speculating in my opinion. Now, currently the markets have changed. We know the markets aren't growing as strongly. So people say to me, Michael, where should we invest now? Oh, this looks like there's going to be a change of government. Uh, They may change the rules. They may change the rules to negative gearing. What, What should I do now? And the answer is no different to what you should have done a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago or in five years time. The fundamentals of sound residential real estate investing don't change because short-term factors change. Your strategy shouldn't change because there will be an election looming next year and there could be a different government. Your strategy, if you 
subscribe to my theory, is to build as big an asset base as you can so that you're going to have choices later on in life. And you've got to do that and minimise your risk. So at Metropole, what we say we do for our clients is help them grow, protect and pass on their wealth. And how we help them protect their wealth is through the right asset protection structures, through the right finance structures, through right owning the right uh, properties, but also understanding where the risk lies. And it may not be where you think it is. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the myth of risk, because what most of us have been taught about risk is wrong, and it's probably holding you back from obtaining real wealth. Conventionally, we're taught that there's a continuum of risk, starting with low-risk investments at one end of the spectrum, to highly speculative, risky investments at the other end. And if you're like me, you've been led to believe that any investment can be placed somewhere along this continuum, and in general, the higher the risk, the greater the potential rewards. Now, the fundamental problem with this logic is that you were taught to evaluate the risk in an investment without the investment itself. And there's something very important missing from the equation, and that's you, the investor. Look, imagine you're considering undertaking a small property development. Traditionally, you'd look at this proposal in isolation and ask yourself, well, is this a risky venture? But here's the thing. That question is impossible to answer in isolation because we still don't know enough about you. Have you ever invested in property before? Have you ever completed a property development in the past? Do you have the skills, the knowledge, the contacts, the experience success required to, I don't know, successfully complete a property development? And if you've got no or limited knowledge about council zonings, town planning, feasibility studies, building costs and the building process, no matter how good the deal is itself, how good it might look on paper, jumping headlong into your first property development will be a high risk proposition for you. Over the years, I've seen many people make a lot of money out of real estate, but over the same time, in the same markets and in the same economic conditions, I've seen just as many people lose lots of money. The difference is in the individual investor's skills, contacts, strengths and expertise. So in light of this new idea associated with risk assessment, let's take a closer look at what really makes an investment more or less risky. Let's start with what is your area of expertise? What's your experience in your networks, your contacts? They could be your biggest competitive advantage or your most potent risk factor. If you're investing in something that's your specialty, you start with a built-in advantage that will allow you to achieve a higher return than most other investors. The next thing you should look at is what level of control do you have? Because the more control you have over your investment, the lower your associated risk. The third risk factor you should look at is is their transparency. The more you know about what's happening with your investment, the lower your risk. Now, this has really come out recently in the the Haynes Royal Commission, the Banking Commission, where uh, now the the veil has been lifted, you can peek behind the curtains and there's transparency on what's been happening in uh, the superannuation field, in the investment field, in the banking field. You see that what used to be thought as non-risky investments actually lost investors lots of money. Now, another thing as we're looking at what makes an investment more or less risky is how liquid is your investment? How easy is it to access your money by selling your investment or converting it or or part of it into cash? The more liquid the investment, obviously, the lower your risk will be. The next thing to look at is how you achieve your returns. Now, property investors receive their returns in four distinct ways. Cash flow, you know, the rent you receive, capital growth, the increase in the value of your property as the overall values in the area increase, just the general capital growth. Then there's forced appreciation. That's the increase you manufacture by undertaking renovations or development. And the fourth way is through tax benefits, such as depreciation and tax deductions. So as property investors, you make money in some or all of those four ways. And the more secure the returns on your investment and the less dependent you are on any one of these four categories, the less risky your investment will be. The next category to look at when you're assessing risk of investment is is your equity safe. Is the initial money that you outlaid to acquire your investment secure if other things go wrong? Another risk element is 
what is your personal liability? Because when you make an investment, you're sometimes required to give a personal guarantee. Now, if you buy shares in the stock market, you don't. But when you buy a property, yes, you do. Even if you buy it in a company, even if you buy it in a trust, you have to give a personal guarantee. And this gives others, usually the bank, the right to pursue you personally for any lost funds should things go pear shape. Another element to look at is the market risk. Some risks are inescapable as they're inherent to certain markets. For example, if you invest in tourism, you're subject to markets collapsing if a natural disaster occurs, you know, such as a cyclone that happens up north every year or a tsunami or a disease outbreak. So what is the market risk of the investment you're looking at? And the ninth investment risk is the specific investment risk. This is the risk specific to that particular investment itself. Is it the right property in the right suburb at the right price at the right time of the cycle? When assessing risk, most investors focus only on the last two factors, the market risk and the specific investment risk. But this tunnel vision often means that they fail to take account the other critical underlying factors that in many cases are even more significant. So I hope your take-home lesson from our chat now will be that while most investors spend vast amounts of time analysing the deal, you've got to spend more time understanding yourself better. My risk spectrum is very different to yours and relates to my expertise, my background, the things I've done, the lessons I've learned and the mistakes I've made, which means that some types of investment are much less risky for me than they are for you. In the same way, you've got your own risk profile and you need to take the time to assess what that could be. Whenever you consider putting your money into an investment, don't make the mistake of analysing the investment in isolation. Look at that investment in relationship to you, to you the investor. What type of investment choices are low risk for you? What type of investment is medium risk? And which type of investment is more a high risk to you? And remember that even though all investments come with some degree of associated risk, you can change that risk by developing expertise in an area and make the journey to your own financial freedom a low-risk, high-return venture. Now, of course, there's another way of shortcutting things because as you learn and as you get experience, you're going to pay the market a fee, as I have and all successful investors have, a learning fee in education. Another way is actually to get mentors to speed things up for you or to get professional advisors on your side. Now, I've spoken often about the concept of getting advisors rather than salespeople on your side, but why not get the team at Metropole to plan for you, to help you with a strategic property plan, a finance plan, a wealth creation plan, so that you can then implement it using our help or doing it all on your own. Why not go to metropole.com.au and find out about how we can help you and leave your details and we'll get in contact with you or ring us at 1300 Metropole. Now, I see we're coming up for a really short break, and when I come back, I'm going to share with you my mindset moment, and you know that's the session that I love the most in these podcasts, and then I have a chat with Bessie Hassan from finder.com, where we talk about how much Australians lose in scams every week. You'll be amazed at some of the statistics, you'll be surprised how people get taken in, and you'll learn a few things to protect yourself, so I'll see you in just a moment. If you're unsure what to do next in our changing property markets, why not turn to the proven and trusted team at Metropole Property Strategists to take advantage of their expertise of profitably investing through the last five property cycles. The team at Metropole have been involved in over $3 billion worth of property transactions, creating wealth for their clients, and they can do the same for you. They don't sell property, so their advice is independent and unbiased. Metropole can devise a strategy, their buyer's agents will buy your property for you, or you could use their renovations team, property development, or portfolio management services. Arrange a time for an obligation-free chat at metropole.com.au. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. Look, you've heard me say it before, your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings become your actions, and your actions become your results. In other words, what's happening in your inside world 
affects your outside world. I've heard others say it differently. Your words become your actions, which eventually become your destiny. Way back a century ago, Napoleon Hill wrote Think and Grow Rich, and he became uh, the guru at the time of personal success. And he thought that words plant the seeds of either success or failure in the minds of people. Now, I found successful people are intentional about the words they speak, the words they say to themselves, in their heads, in their minds, you know, the sort of self-talk we all have, and the words they use to others. Fact is, regardless of how you may define success, your words, those that you say to yourself and those you say out loud, are going to help manifest the vision, your visions, your goals, whatever you're saying to yourself, into reality. So, I'd like to actually mention to you today five things that happy and successful people never say. The first one is they don't ever say that's impossible. Interestingly, unsuccessful people are always pointing out what's not possible. To them, glass is always half empty. They live in a world of impossibilities. They've got a can't do attitude. So they say, oh, I I can't, or it can't be done, or, or that's impossible. Not only are these words self-limiting, others perceive you as pessimistic, unconstructive, even defeatist. On the other hand, achievers know there are countless roadblocks on the road to success. They know there's going to be barriers that could stall them, could stump them, but that are never going to stop them. They either remove the barrier or figure out a way around it, under it or around it. So successful people say things like, look, I've got a choice, or here are our options, or let's imagine all the possibilities. They don't say that's impossible. Another thing they don't say is, I can do it all myself. Successful people know the importance of getting a good team around them, and they recognize if they're the smartest person in the team, they're in trouble. So they have mentors to coach them. They've become part of mastermind groups where they can deal with other people. So successful people don't say, I can do it all myself. And they also don't say, that's not fair, because we know life's not fair. So saying it's not fair is just another way of suggesting that Life's supposed to be fair, and it shows you don't really have a handle on how things work. Successful people are successful because when the odds are against them, they try even harder rather than complaining and giving up. So another word that successful people don't say is, I'll try. The word try sounds tentative, suggests you lack confidence in your ability to execute the task. So take full ownership over your capabilities. So if you're asked to do something, either commit to doing it, or offer an alternative, but don't say you're going to try because it sounds like you'll try. Well, it sounds like you won't try that hard, I guess. Remember what Star in Star Wars, what Yoda said: "Do or do not. There is no try." Look, I was going to try and do that in a Yoda accent, but that would have come across stupidly. Another thing successful people don't say is, "I already know that." Uh, that, that's uh, uh, defensiveness. It means you stop trying to learn and grow and you become more interested in being perceived as knowing all. It's one thing to speak knowledgeably about a topic and add insights, but there's always more to learn. And even if you do know it, have a think about it. Are you using the knowledge? Are you implementing it? I see this with people who come to my seminars all the time and they say, oh, I know all that. But interestingly, they don't do it. Maybe I'll just throw one more thing in that successful people don't say. They don't gossip. They don't say, oh, he's stupid, she's lazy, he's a jerk. They avoid words of judgment, of insult, of negativity. Successful people have learned if you can't say something good about somebody, don't say anything at all. So the message I want to leave you with today is think about the things you're saying to yourself and what you're saying to others. Think about the things you need to stop saying. Then... Stop saying them, because eliminating these words and phrases from your vocabulary will pay big dividends to you. The problem is, they've got a tendency to sneak up on us all, so you're going to have to catch yourself until you solidify the habit of not saying those words, and then starting to use the self-talk successful people use. The Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, is warning the public to watch out for investment scammers who promise great returns, but they leave their victims with broken dreams and empty bank accounts. Interestingly, in the first half of 2017, Australians reported losing over $13 million to investment scams, according to Scamwatch, the ACCC's website, um, with 
close to 1,800 investment scams reported in the first half of this year. This equates to about 10 reports every single day. And the losses of the, these scams are horrific. Australians are losing about a million dollars a week to investment scams. Last year, they lost 1.3 million to investment scams. So to get a better understanding of what's going on, I'm going to chat with Bessie Hassan, money expert at finder.com. Hi, Bessie. Hi, Michael. So what are the different scams out there? Look, there are several, and what we need to remember is that scammers are sneaky and they each operate in a different way, which is why it can sometimes be difficult to identify scams in the first place. Some get people to invest in fake investment offers, others offer investment offers which don't even exist or trick people into giving the money by posing as a well-known investment company. Sometimes scammers target people in, in in all sorts of ways, whether it's emails or phone calls or text messages or even on social media these days. So if you do receive any form of suspicious communication, don't click on links, don't open attachments, don't ever reveal any banking or personal details. Now, Bessie, I know you've done a bit of research into this. So what has Finder.com found? Are there particular age groups that tend to be targeted by scammers? There is indeed. Our research has found it's often people aged 45 to 64 who are most at risk. Um, and according to Scamwatch, uh, it's slightly skewed towards males as well at about 54% and females are, are 45, 46%. So males are more gullible, are they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what the research has found. Okay. And it's interesting the age group as well. I guess the younger people are more tech savvy. They're aware uh, that these things can happen. Yeah, look, it could be that. We're, certainly um, in today's lifestyle, we, we're used to getting those scam emails, unfortunately, and often they look so real with mm. you know, bank logos and things like that. So it can be very tempting to, to go through the, the process and to click on links and to hand over details as well. Um, but really, you should be cautious throughout the year of scammers. Keep it in the back of your mind and be particularly vigilant at this time of year because uh, they're preying on people people's fear of getting into trouble with the ATO as well. So how do you protect yourself from scams, Bessie? Well, learn about scam tactics and what to do if they think you're being targeted by a scammer. So financial providers and government departments never require you to enter your account or internet banking details. So don't do it. If you've been asked to provide this, don't hand it over get straight on the phone uh, to your bank or, or to the alleged uh, brand or company to find out if it is a, a legitimate um, requirement. A lot of the time it will not be. Financial providers also need an Australian financial services license from ASIC in order to be able to legally carry out their service. So if you feel like they're uh, you're being targeted by a scammer or that they are, ask them for uh, their license number. Understand safe and unsafe ways to share your personal information and transfer funds. So you can check ASIC's list of companies you should not deal with before you invest. Um, on Twitter as well, you can follow Scamwatch um, or you can uh, even subscribe to Scamwatch Radar Alerts and that, that helps you keep up to date with advice for avoiding uh, the latest scams that are affecting the community. I guess you've also got to watch out for certain terms, expressions, things people promise. You know, if they say risk-free investment, run a mile, low risk, high return, you know, be a millionaire in three years, buy seven properties in seven minutes. We yeah. keep getting those in our emails all the time, don't we, Bessie? Exactly. And often it's as simple as this. This, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. So you're absolutely right. Low risk, high return, be a millionaire in three years. Here's how to get rich quick. Hmm, there's probably more to it than meets the eye. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, C say that the scams tend to revolve around uh, traditional real estate, stock investments, commodities, and people yep. seem to claim they've got the latest tips, insider information, high returns. Now, there are some really good seminars out there, and I've got to give a disclaimer, I do seminars as well, but I actually never sell anything in the back of the room, sell properties. So go, don't go to those sort of things with your checkbook and be very, very careful and don't make instant decisions based on emotions. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree there. Um, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Do your research, look into it further, ring ring up, try to gather more information yourself and then um, see, see if it does seem 
uh, as good in real life. I guess it's those old emotions of fear and greed that still drive us, don't they, Bessie? They do. We we all want, want some extra cash in our bank accounts. <laughs> sure. Well, Bessie Hassan, uh, money expert from finder.com, thank you so much for your time and for giving us those warnings. Thank you, Michael. We're almost at the end of the show, so I hope you're now a more informed investor. You're going to understand a bit more about risk. You're going to understand what scams to watch out for and what not to do. But I'd like to read out a review I received. Now, I love getting these reviews on iTunes, on Stitcher, on uh, Google Play, wherever you listen. So if you've enjoyed the show, please say thank you by leaving me a review because it rates the show better. More people find out about it. And my aim is to get this message out to as many people as possible to stop them falling prey to the scams that are around and the risks that are around. So why don't you tell somebody about this episode of the show if you got some benefit from it. But recently, Grim Jube left a review on iTunes saying, my weekly inspiration, absolutely great podcast, Michael. I'm only just starting on my first renovation and your podcast gives me all the information and direction I could possibly ask for and opened my mind to the big picture in property development. I'll be speaking to the Metropole team to help me in the future plans. Thanks for everything. Well, you're more than welcome. Nathan, and actually left that and I want to say thank you for leaving that Nathan and if you leave a review and I read it out I'll give you one of my books just send me an email telling me your details michael at metropole.com.au and I look forward to receiving your honest review I also look forward to catching up with you this time next week for my next chat Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from today's show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review and we'll read it out on a future show and Michael will gift you one of his books as a way of saying thank you. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review and let us know what you think. If you don't already subscribe, head over to iTunes or your favorite Android app. You'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. You'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes.